Well, welcome back to some more lectures in our second term of computational physics. And we've recently been talking about partial differential equations, PDEs as the world calls them. And there's different kinds of PDEs and there's different kinds of solutions. So if you haven't already, we started off the discussion with uh, electric fields, Laplace's equation, Poisson's equation. And I suggest that you go look at those before this lecture, because that's we talked about the general field, and it's a little bit easier, uh, a little less dynamic. This is a little more interesting. So a, the reason you have partial differential equations is because you have more than one variable. At the same time, you have to solve an equation which things vary in different places. When we solved Laplace's equation, we had two space variables. We could make it three, same idea, and they could each vary independently. Now we'll talk about heat flow. And we're talking about heat flow. We have space and time, so those are the two variables. Space, of course, could be three variables, so we could have a four-dimensional problem just as easily. Uh, the algorithm is just simply generalized for that. But just handling space and time is more dynamic now, because things will literally change in time. And we'll talk about a very standard technique. It's a fun technique. It's known as time-stepping, or the leapfrog method. Uh, obvious leapfrog says you get from here to there by jumping, and that's what this is. It's just time jumping. <clears throat> so let's go ahead. Here's our problem. We have a bar, a metal bar, here in beautiful red, at 100 degrees centigrade. Okay, So it's hot. It had just been taken out of a pan of boiling water, let's say, or been heated up. It's surrounded by insulation. This is a very fancy kind of styrofoam here. It's sort of orange color. So this is the insulation. So no heat flows from, heat, you know, from the uh, length of the bar. The width of the bar, W here at the ends, this is where the heat flows. You know? So the heat flows out this way because the ends are kept in ice water. So they're at zero degrees centigrade. Okay? So the heat is flowing out of the bar at all times. And the question is, what happens to the metal bar inside this insulated sheath? Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or an Einstein to figure out the bar is going to get colder. Yes, the bar is going to get colder. How is it going to get colder? It's going to start off hot, and if you wait long enough, it's going to be at the same temperature as the outside because heat will be conducted from the interior to the outside. And that's pretty much it. You expect the heat, the temperature, to decay in time, maybe even exponentially, uh, probably exponentially, because what else can we say? And that's our problem. Okay? So specifically, we have an aluminum bar. Why aluminum? We're telling you aluminum because then you know the density and the heat capacity and the thermal conductivity, all these constants which you look up in a book. Uh, we know the length is one meter. It's, it's, uh, it's along the x-axis just so we all agree on that. And it's insulated, and I've said all this already. So let's look at the problem. How do we solve this problem? Well, the theory we wish to apply is the heat equation. And it's a parabolic differential, partial differential equation. So let's talk about it. What do we know? What do you know about heat? The most elementary thing you can say about heat is that in nature, Heat flows from hot to cold. What is heat? Heat's a form of energy, thermal energy. And what is hot? It's higher temperature. What is cold? Lower temperature. It's hard to define. We know what it means otherwise, but uh, from statistical mechanics. But that's good enough. Okay. So heat flows from hot to cold, high temperature to low temperature. So that's described by equation one. H, the heat flow. We won't use this again. <coughs> is equal to some constant. The thermal conductivity, K, times the, the gradient of the temperature, okay, with a minus sign because it goes from high to low. Simple as that. So that's heat conductivity, equation one. What else do we know? Well, we, we, we know that if we have an object like a bar, it has a certain amount of heat that it contains. And in this case, our bar has a certain amount of heat, and it's going to lose all that heat to the ice water reservoirs at the end. So if we ask how much heat energy, or heat Q, is contained in an object, we'd say, OK, we just integrate over the whole volume of the object. That's the integration over dx. 
a constant C known as the heat capacity or the specific heat. Rho of X is the density of the material, rho, so like aluminum, that's what we told you. It could be uniform or it could be uh, vary with position. In this case, you could say, you know, it, it's uniform except at the end when it goes to zero. Fine. So that limits the volume to just uh, the bar. And T is the temperature at each position, capital T, and lowercase t is the time. So the heat at any time is given by this integration of the temperature over the object with the density. Fine. So that's, that's the two basic equations, the two simple laws of nature that we start with. So that's the theory. And then we can say, OK, the heat equation just says heat flows from hot to cold. Heat is Q. Okay? So equation three is the heat equation. It says the change in temperature with time, partial derivative, because the temperature also depends on space. The change of temperature with time is equal to these constants here times the change in heat flow here, change in heat flow, which is the second derivative of the temperature, because the heat flow is the first derivative. So the change in heat flow is what gives you the temperature difference. So that's the heat equation. It, since we have a one-dimensional problem, equation three turns into the very simple form, equation four. So we have here a very nice equation. We have the heat equation in one dimension. And if we look at it, we can say it's an interesting equation. It is a parabolic equation. Parabolic because in this form it has a first derivative, in this case with time, on the left-hand side, and has a second derivative on the right-hand side. And we can add on x, we can have y, we can have z for, for the second derivatives. But it's no longer as symmetric as Laplace's equation, which just had second derivatives. We have mixed first and second derivatives. And because of that, we have a more complicated kind of solution. We have a different solution. Maybe more complicated. Some people might think it's simpler. But at least it's mixed and different in form. Okay? So I should say, this is also another one of these cases and this wonderful textbook here, which go out and buy a copy quickly, uh, g describes how to find the analytic solution of it. But it's not really an analytic solution. It's an infinite series here. It goes out to infinity. And it's a function of space and time, it's a Fourier series, and it's given here. The interesting part of the Fourier series is if you look at what happens in time, it says, oh, there's an exponential here in it. Every single term, each, and k here is some unknown, but it depends on the just geometry, the, uh, the wave vector. Every single term varies with exponentially decreasing time. So the solution does, in fact, fall off the temperature falls off as a function of time exponentially. That's true. If you look at the space terms, you, could, you see the sine of kx, where x is the length along the bar. That's oscillatory. But you know, common sense, we started off with this bar, and it's just going to cool. There's no oscillations. There can't be any oscillations. Nothing's oscillating. So these terms, that's the problem for your series. Each term oscillates, but you add up an infinite number of them, and the oscillations dampen out, and you get a constant, a smooth variation. So that's why this, again, it's not a very good numerical algorithm, because you need an infinite number of terms. And once you cut that down to a finite number, you get oscillations, which are spurious. So the algorithm we'll show you now, you'll verify, has no spurious oscillations. So here's our problem, again. We need to solve the heat equation. We'll take it as a one-dimensional, only space, one x space, second derivative of space, first derivative of time. But now we have two kinds of conditions to impose. Okay, and that's why this is a little more complicated. It's not as symmetric as Laplace's equation. We have initial conditions. And initial always means time equals 0. That's what initial means, the initial time. You can say, what if it's time equals 100? OK, time equals 100. We'll call it 0 just for simplicity. But it's the initial time we're given the solution at. So here we're given that the, at time 0, 100 degrees centigrade. Okay, that's the temperature of the bar. The boundary conditions don't change with time. That says for all time, you know, all time, that's what makes the boundary conditions not initial. The end of the bar, the ends of the bar are kept at zero. So it's good to keep these in mind. You know, one is initial just at one time, the other are for all times, and, but at two positions in space. Okay? 
So how do we solve this? Let's look at the next slide, please. So as before, we try to solve this problem by setting up a grid in space. Except now, the space is space-time. So we have, along the x-axis, which will be the variable i, we have space. But along the time axis here, which is j, along the ordinate, we'll have time. So we'll start off t equal to 0 at the top of our space. And then, you know, at t equals 0, we know the boundary condition. We know the values here. So that's the initial conditions at this boundary. Okay. The actual boundary conditions are in blue here, and they don't change with time. Okay. So these are the boundary conditions here. This bar is always kept at temperature zero. Okay. So the technique, as before, will be to say, we have a differential equation to solve. We will express the derivatives in terms of finite differences. Uh, for values of the, not the potential now, but rather values of the temperature along this grid. And then we'll have a difference equation, and we'll solve it just at these lattice sites, always keeping the boundary conditions in blue fixed and the initial, starting with the initial conditions. Okay. You may ask the question, why can't we use that relaxation technique? We talked about Laplace's equation. It was so nice. It was trouble-free. You really couldn't go wrong. And the answer is, well, if we knew the temperature at the la at latter time, if we were given that as additional information, aha, then we'd have it contained in a box, and we could use some kind of relaxation technique. We don't know what, what's happening down here. In fact, the time can go on to infinity as long as you want. So this is open-ended that way. We need another technique. So the leapfrog technique, and it's the technique which we're showing you here with this, these boxes, uh, this is the algorithm, says that we'll, we'll take a solution at one time, and then we'll figure out a way of, of moving that solution ahead to a latter time. Okay, so it takes the present time solution, moves it one step into the future, and then, the f aha, then we have a solution along the whole row here. We can take what was the future, call that the present, and move it ahead. And since we start with a known initial condition at the top, that's it. We stop with known values here. We jump ahead one step. We leapfrog one step into the future. The future then becomes the present. We leapfrog again. So this is called time stepping or leapfrogging. Numerically, we'll start off with a finite difference, a forward difference. Take it back. Forward difference approximation for the time derivative. Why forward difference? Well, that's all we could do because of the initial conditions. Okay, so we'll say the time derivative of the temperature is the time at a step forward minus the time at the present. Okay? So that's not a very good approximation, but we're, not, we're only told the initial t temperature for one value here. So we can't really go ahead much better than that. For the second derivative, however, we can use a central difference, space derivative, which is much better. So for the second der derivative, we'll say the temperature second derivative of the temperature at point x, y, you take the step one step forward, you go back one step minus the value. So this is just the standard formula we've seen for the second derivative, uh, minus twice the temperature, right? So that's a better approximation. But that's the best we could do. So if we put those pieces together, <coughs> we, the, uh, part, the differential equation we had becomes a difference equation. So we see here, equation 1 is now just a difference equation for the heat equation. So the first derivative on the left-hand side with respect to time, we get two different time values. And then the right-hand side, we get that garble of constants again. And we, then we have a space derivative, second space derivative, delta x minus delta x minus 2. That's just the second space derivative. So that is the heat equation. And now you can say, OK. How do we turn that finite difference form of the heat equation into an algorithm? Well, the answer is either you're clever or you realize the best we can do is step ahead one step. So to step ahead one step, we need to say 
let's look at where the time can change and here we have it so here we have the solution at the future on this side and this is the present here t and here t is also the present and here is also the present and here is also the present so we have one one term with the future and all the other terms involve the present so obviously we separate the future put it keep it on the left hand side so this is the future on the left hand side and then on the right hand side all of these terms are just the past so the algorithm says okay we take <clears throat> the potential I'm sorry the temperature at a, at a point to the left and the temperature at a point to the right and a temperature right in the middle and we use those three values to predict what the temperature in the middle here will be in the future. That's it. And then we just go through and apply this algorithm every place. At the boundary conditions, we always keep that zero, but th we can always then, you know, that's fine. We can use that boundary condition to move here, use this boundary condition to move there, and likewise. So it works every place. Okay? So we just apply this algorithm throughout the grid one step at a time. And it's not a relaxation algorithm. We just do it once. We just pass through boom and we're done how accurate is it well you make you can make the time step smaller and smaller in general to make it more and more accurate which tends to work if smaller time step we only have here the time derivative is forward different so we need small time steps but we start at the top move ahead one row at a time we get all of the values one row ahead again so this is what's known as an explicit solution because we can actually write down what the solution is in the future explicitly in terms of the past. What sort of bothers some maybe is it's not symmetric. We treat space and time differently. Shouldn't we do it the same? Well, maybe if we were clever enough we could, but the equation's not uh, the same. It's a first derivative in time, second derivative in space, so that affects the algorithm. So let's get on. Let's look at the pictures here. You don't have to rest too much, but I will. Here's our problem. We have our bar kept at 100, and we finite width, which doesn't come in here, finite length L, and the solution you should get could say, should say the obvious thing. This is the temperature at 100 here, and now this is position along the bar, so these are the x values, right? So here's the bar, and now this is time. So as we move out in time, the solution should fall off to zero, which means the bar cools every position in the bar. But at first, the middle of the bar, always, the middle of the bar cools the slowest, so the middle of the bar is the hottest, and then it falls off, which is just what we see here in time. So, you know, that's what it should look like. Uh, no bouncing, no oscillations, because it, it falls uniformly. So we have two codes, uh, in this case, two Python codes. I'll sh show you the animated one here. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is actually the, co the sample code we're giving you. And what you should see is it takes some while to set up the whole grid, get Python working. And there is the bar. There's the temperature as a function of time. And it's cooling slowly, you know, more and more slowly at the end because the s less temperature it has, the slower the cooling. Remember, it's the heat difference, the temperature difference that controls the heat rate. So it starts off very fast, and then it goes on forever and ever until you push the little button here and then it's done. Okay, so uh, that, what do you have to do? <clears throat> you have to use this and solve your problem. Will it work always? No. So let's look at this next slide, slide 20, and think about how you can determine when a method like this works. I've told you to always make the time step small to get high precision. Is that enough? Well, Johnny von Neumann was one of these mathematical geniuses. He not only helped invent the modern di digital computer, he also helped invent the techniques we use on the digital computer to solve equations, such as these partial differential equations. So here we have equation one is our algorithm for solving the heat equation. It tells us the future time, future temperature, in terms of the temperature at the present time. And notice that I've 
gotten away from the I and J index here. I've kept the J index for time, but not the I index, because I will now represent shortly the imaginary number. Okay, so the real question pe mathematicians like von Neumann would worry about would be, we're going to solve a difference equation and get a solution. Just because we find, even if it's a stable solution of the differential equation, does that mean we have a good approximation for the partial differential equation? Well, that's a hard question to really answer. If you look at the books like Morse and Feshbach, which is in the references, and they refer back to von Neumann and uh, Courant, they usually derive whether or not you have a solution of the PDE by changing the PDE to a difference equation and looking at the difference equation solution. So the answer is generally yes. If you get a solution to the difference equation, it corresponds to a solution of the PDE, okay, if it's a good solution. But then you can say, what is a good solution of the difference equation? Well, if the solution blows up, if it goes to infinity, if it's unstable, that's not very good. So you can ask the question, when will the solution of the difference equation be stable? And that's known as von Neumann stability analysis, interestingly enough. And you can do it for many differential equations. The technique is the same. And even if you make some approximation, it gives you a good handle on whether or not you'll get a good solution. So we have here, let's go back, equation one. Equation one is the heat equation. Future, present, present, present. We'll assume the temperature has some eigenmodes. In other words, this equation may have a solution, regardless of the boundary condition, just like Fourier analysis, of some form. And we'll assume some exponential form, as we have here in equation two. So let's assume that the temperature at step m, uh, pos uh, yes, uh, position m in space, time j, is given by some amplitude raised to the power j and some exponential in space. So this is very similar to what we had a Fourier, we did with the Fourier analysis. If you remember when I showed you that, and I said it really wasn't good, but this is what happens in Fourier analysis. Okay, we have a, t a step here which can grow or decrease in time, and then we have an oscillatory term in space, which is just like a Fourier sine coefficient. What we have here is an amplitude. Obviously, if the amplitude is less than one, this c, the e-like thing, this c, is less than one, then when we raise it to power j for each succeeding time step, the amplitude gets smaller and smaller, and it doesn't blow up. If the amplitude is equal to one, we're fine. If the amplitude is less than, greater than one, then the technique blows up. We get exponential blow up. Okay, so that's the idea. K is just some number we can deduce sometimes, the wavelength of the solution. Uh, and we look for stable eigenmodes. So we require the modulus of C to be less than 1. And the way you do that is you just substitute this assumed form, equation 2, for the eigenmodes into the equation, equation 1, which is the heat equation, or whatever equation you have to be solving in. You have to choose the appropriate eigenmodes, just like you would for Fourier analysis. And you ask, when will this amplitude be less than 1? Well, here, we can solve for the amplitude which is equation 3 here, and we get this equation. You may say, so, oh, it's a mess. I hate these messes. Well, it's not so bad. It says that c is equal to 1, which is good. 1 is the number we like, and a number which, aha, changes in position times 2 epsilon, 2 eta times cosine minus 1. We know cosine is always a number between plus and minus 1, so we know how big this is. And so if, if, if eta here is less than a half, then we have no problem. Then just oscillates, never gets greater than 1. Okay? And as long as the amplitude stays less than 1, it'll be small on succeeding terms. It won't blow up. So the condition, and this is interesting, the condition says that in order for the solution to be stable, in other words, in order for the numerical solution to really work, the ampli this, const this combination of parameters, the heat capacity on the bottom, the density, the thermal conductivity on the top times the time step divided by the space step squared must be less than a half. That's a lot of talking. And what that says is, this is very interesting. You know, this guy Landau just told us always make the space, the time step smaller 
in order to get better precision. And this analysis says this term eta must always be less than one, half. Okay. Well, he's right. If you make delta t smaller and smaller, you make eta smaller and smaller, the solution gets more and more stable. Okay. That's good. But then you could say, hey, you know, I, what if I want to find the heat on you know, a pocket comb? Which if I had one, I'd show it to you. You know, with, with this, a lot of space variation. Or some waveguide with teeth in it. Well, you may want a very small delta x. And here the unobvious thing happens, the non-obvious thing, which is if you make delta x the space step smaller, then to the squared power, no less, you tend to make eta larger and larger and the method becomes unstable. So making the space step smaller makes the solution worse. So what do you do? Well, what you do here is for every, you know, every two, if, if you reduce the space step by a factor of two, then you simultaneously have to reduce the time step by a factor of four. Okay, so this is interesting. This is sort of a lot of mathematics you just as soon not have forced you to go through. But when you do it, if you can do it, it gives you a handle on what you may spend six months trying to determine empirically to say you can't just vary these two independently. The time step always, but the space step not. Don't believe a word I have to say. Don't believe any of this, okay? We're going to give you an algorithm. We've given you the algorithm. Try it yourself. See if it behaves like that. Make time step smaller and smaller. The answer looks good. Make space step smaller. Boom. It'll blow up and see if it satisfies this. So that's what's nice about this. Not in every problem can you actually do this analysis so neatly, but this is a neat one. And von Neumann was a pretty smart guy. OK, so what about the implementation that we want you to actually run a code and modify? A sample code is given. The Python version is equation heat.python. Uh, I won't show it to you now. It's the same algorithm as we've been seeing one-line algorithm, most of the code is just setting up the initial conditions and boundary conditions. And that's the hard part here, because the boundary conditions, of course, are the ends of the bar at 0, always. The initial condition is the top row, starts at 100. That's it. Okay. So the heart of the algorithm is a, an array, a two-dimensional array, dimension 101 for the first index, that's space, if you make the grid finer in space, that has to increase. So there's 100 variables here, the endpoint, and just two for the time index, the j index. Why two? Because we only need to s s uh, keep in the computer to store in memory the present and the future times. We, we know the present time. We then predict the future from it. As soon as we have the future predicted, we write it out to a file. So we write the temperature for all the whole row as soon as we have a row predicted, out to a file, and then we don't, don't have to save it anymore. Then we can just move ahead. Okay, or you can write out the present temperature and then change the uh, present to what was the future and then calculate a new future. So you only need a present and a future, two indices here. Okay. And that matters. Okay. Uh, you actually don't have to output it to the file, which you'll look at and plot every step. Because as I said, you'll often make very fine time steps. And for each time step, you get a, a new value of the row. And it, you'll see no difference from one step to the other. You know, the difference will only be in the uh, eighth or tenth decimal, decimal place, maybe. So sometimes you wait. I think the code here gives you 300 steps waiting, and then it prints out to a file. Sometimes I've waited 500 or 1,000 steps, and then print out to the file. And it's still as smooth as can be. Okay, for the for the eye, so that's part of the technique. What you should plot here is another surface plot. Here, the surface plot will be the temperature as a function of position and as a function of time. The the uh, the uh, constant surface contours are known as isotherms. Okay, so that's the areas where the temperature is constant, and it must be smooth. Must because intuitively, physically, the bar just cools off. All of it cools off. The center cools off more slowly than the rest. And the cooling becomes fast at first when the, the big temperature difference as the bar cools. It gets colder, doesn't heat, doesn't cool. Heat doesn't transfer as quickly, slows down. You vary the time step and the space step. Always do that. 
see how much the solution changes, and now you know something, you have a trick up your sleeve. You know that you can make the time step smaller and smaller, it should only look better and better. But if you make the, time, the space step smaller and smaller, the solution should become unstable. See if that happens, and then see if when it does happen, if it agrees with the uh, von Neumann condition that the constant eta, which is that mix of uh, physical constant and step sizes, whether that has become too large. Okay? And here, we give you the numeric solution from the code. We know the analytic solution. Compare the two. Again, the analytic solution, the Fourier series, probably is not the best. It has trouble unless you use many, many terms. If you see oscillations in the analytic solution, that's just what I want you to see. That shows you it's not a very good algorithm. So enjoy yourself. Uh, you know what it should work like. Uh, this is a simple method. It sh has to work. We know it'll be stable. We'll take a break now. Next time, we'll talk about the industrial strength method for solving the heat equation. Obviously, heat equations are very important. Automotive design, engine design, building design, all of these things. How do you really calculate how much heat flows? You just solve the equation. So there is a better method. Uh, we were not, you could tell, I was sort of squirming with the first time derivative because that was only a forward difference method. So the next way we show you how to improve that, make the first time derivative also a central difference. But it gets more complicated. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You pay a price. So next time, uh, we'll come back after lunch, and we'll talk about Crank Nicholson. So see you till then. Bye-bye. <laughs>